Okay, evening, sisters, um, brothers as well. Um, I want to thank one of my co lovely commenters for correcting me. And I kept saying the dignity of the apocalypse would be sacrificed. Um, thank you so much, because that is a big blunder, really. Um, it's, of course, the Armageddon that we want to avert, not the apocalypse. The apocalypse is actually what we're striving to understand, the unveiling. Um, what's hidden? We want to know what's hidden. So thank you so much for correcting that. And, of course, if you're going to screw up like I do, you want to do it major league. So I couldn't have said it more times than I did. You know, the dignity of the apocalypse, the dignity of the apocalypse. I must have said it a hundred times in that video. Um, and it's really Armageddon. So thank you so much for, for correcting me on that. I appreciate that so much. Um, like I, I do blunder and I do it often and I watch my videos and I'll see it. That one I never caught. I just like, uh, you know, it was the comment I read, I guess, and it just stuck in my head. But it, yeah, <laughs> apocalypse means unveiling. Yeah, I studied that too. Um, anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate that for that, that information. <laughs> um, don't hesitate to correct me. Uh, I generally, I see my, my blunders, you know, after I watch the videos. Um, and that one went by me again. I watched the video, I confess, and I, I never thought any, any differently. I think I was thinking, well, the uh, apocalyptic movies, because even they got that term screwed up, right? Or Megiddo, uh, Megiddo in the Valley of Megiddo uh, is where, um, you know, Armageddon is supposed to, to play out. Uh, anyway, enough of that. I'm going to confess I don't know how great tonight's video is going to be. Um, I'm really exhausted tonight. I can hardly keep my eyes open. I'm really tired. I just want to sleep right now. Um, but we're going to try to do at least some on transmigration of the soul. Um, I don't know that I'll share everything that I had hoped to pick up. We'll eventually get to it at some point is my, my sincere hope. I won't make it a promise, but my sincere hope is that we'll get to it. Um, at some point, um, so sorry for the clicking of my pen, um, that aggravates some people. Um, and it aggravates me when other people do <laughs> sometimes. Um, okay, so where am I actually going here? Going there. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to, I think, metempsychosis. Now, we understood in Transmigration of the Soul that metempsychosis is um, another term sometimes used synonymously with metempsychosis is palingenesis. There I go again with the pen. And so palingenesis is a word that you find in the Greek, in Strong's Greek. Uh, I gave you the number in the last one, in the last um, transmigration of the soul video, uh, the one before the last. No, I don't, I can't find it. Um, but yeah, it's in the New Testament, which is why we can validate that, that that's what we're looking at. We are looking at reincarnation. Um, metempsychosis is the transmigration of the soul, especially its reincarnation after death. Um, it is another term sometimes used synonymously, is synonymously, right? Um, is palingenesis. So um, we know that they use that in the New Testament, rebirth, right? Um, and so when we hit on reincarnation, cause this is where we're, we're going to go. So if you pull this up on Wikipedia, pull up metempsychosis. And, uh, if you're interested, do some of the reading here. Some of it's very, um, in depth. Um, but we know that that word palingenesis occurs and that it's synonymous with metempsychosis and this whole idea of the transmigration of the soul into a new body. And we get the rebirth in the New Testament um, of being gave a new body. So then we hit on from metempsychosis, we're going to hit on the word reincarnation. And I'm just going to read right here. For those who has issues with, um, 
you know, thinking about things and reason them out. Romans 12, 2 says this, okay? Um, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now, we're saturated with customs and behaviors and things we can and we cannot do in religion, right? Particularly in Christianity, um, Judaism, Islamists. Um, I'm not so certain about um, Buddhism and, and um, all the religions from, um, you know, the the Asian uh, background, like in Buddhism and, and that background. But we are going to read on some of that in this because it does um, have a pivotal, 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 I'll get a pivotal role um, in reincarnation and, and kind of the backbone of that particular religion in, in Indian religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sh um, Sikhism, or Sh I know I'm not saying that right, um, Schism. Uh, I'm not sure how they say that. But it, it says here, Romans 12, 2, so you got to change the way that you think to get to the truth, to the heart of it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. And so when I, I read that, it took me to uh, the verse in Isaiah 29, you approach to me with the vain traditions of men. And, and that's all wrapped up in, you know, religion is what it is. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will know, you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, right? Um, so Strong's Greek transform 3339. And then there's Strong's Greek, renewing, 342. Noun feminine, renewal, as in completing a process. Um, you're complete when you, you come with this, come up with this new truth. Uh, and I don't mean come up with it. I mean you allow the Spirit to lead you into it. Um, make fresh, new branch. Um, so uh, I would recommend looking at Isaiah 43.19, Isaiah 42.9, Isaiah 48.6. Jeremiah 31, 22. Um, those are, you know, all part of this greater understanding that you get a hold of. And people will say, well, you lose, you're leaving huge parts of the Bible out of it. And, but that's exactly what the little book is in the final days. Um, that the seventh thunders utter. It is a little book of truth in there. It's not this big old biblios um, that men added to and wrote. And this, this is written by men. It's written by men. God tells us there is a little thread of that silver truth, water, the pure water, um, that's going to to wash the blood and filth of this lie off of us, um, which is the current law system, the religious law system, is what built this current civil law system um, that we revolve our lives around. And uh, we were to change the way that we look at that. We really are. Um, so this big old Biblios is, you know, I call it the harlot's romance. In <laughs> some some way, it, it feels like, and I, I should actually make a video with that title. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but that's exactly what it is. It's a harlot's romance slash Baal's desire to be bowed down and worshipped that's ruining this world. And it's that particular relationship. Um you know, that the harlots think that this is love and it's is um you know, a little heaven born love. I caught I caught on to that one too. A little heaven born love um can can see the difference between a world uh built on faith and a world without faith. And um I think we see that. I do. We we see that it's it's not built on faith at all. It's built on um you know this the harlot's romance, the idea of what romance is, because she just won't pick her head up and, and realize that this is not this is not romantic in any sense. This is absolute hatred from Baal, who desires worship of himself as God. And um, so I, I just can't help but think of it every time I see these women playing man's fool. Um, I just think, oh, there's the harlot's romance, you know, so in love with this lie. Um, and it, it does, it says that in the New Testament, in Second Timothy, um, that women that are laden, uh, you know, away, you know, by their own foolish lusts, their own ridiculous notions that this is actually 
love towards them from God. And it's just, it's crazy. So anyway, in reincarnation, sorry, I babbled too long there. Um, I don't know how long this video will be, I'll be honest. Um, but I feel that I owe it to you. Um, okay, so where did I want to go? <laughs> so, you know, let's just... um you know, kind of scan this a little bit. So this is in Wikipedia, under Wikipedia's uh, reincarnation. Um, and you can hit on this without even typing it in when you type in madam psychosis. So you're going to type in something. Um, so let's just start reading conceptual definitions. The word reincarnation derives from a Latin term that literally means entering the flesh again. There we go with reborn rebirth. Pale in Genesis. Now, I'm quite upset with myself that I can't find that word. You know what? I'm going to go in. I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Another thing. Let me put this down. Before I forget it, because I will. I won't go back to it again. Um, you know, I was looking at Tav. We had discussed this briefly in the last video, yesterday's video. That what appears on the women's forehead is, you know, literally Emmet. Mother's, with M means mother. Emmet is truth. Now, we, we discovered in the folklore, in the Jewish folklore, um, the golem. And often the word that they would write on the golem was Emmet, right? <laughs> to, to make it live and, and do their bidding. And when they want it to, to, bring it back down into death, because met means death, they would take the E off. But M, E-M, means mother, right? And M, it means truth. So you got mothers of truth, and it's your mother that you deny, which takes you down into death, right? We discovered that. So in the last video, I had said when, when um, uh, sorry, the angels <laughs> went in, to mark those who had not bowed the knee to Baal, there was 7,000. That was in the book of, of uh, Ezekiel, I believe it was. Um, you know, he's marked this X. Well, X is the, the mitochondrial of the, you know, it's the feminine. It's the mother, really, of us all. And it says in Malachi 2, have we not all one father? It says, no, we don't. No, we do not all have one father. We do, however, all have one mother because we get XY, which is the male, and XX, which is the female. Well, the common denominator there is X, your mother. And so we all have one mother, but that was what got denied as your creator, maker, and potter, we discovered, right? Sorry, I'm going into the metempsychosis and reincarnation in a minute. And on the last video, I said when they went in, they marked it with Emmet, which was symbolized by the mitochondrial, the X, the X chromosome. But this is the other interesting part, and I just barely hit on this like a half hour ago. So, I mean, this is the way the spirit works with me. Um, it may seem coincidental, but it's ironic how it just, it's something that I actually said. And then God will validate that for me and say, well, maybe you want to add this in, or you want to say this. And it, it's it's amazing how it lines up. It's It's not coincidental. So the Hebrew letter Tav, you know, which is your, your number 22 of the Hebraic alphabet, um, represents what? <laughs> the Hebrew letter Tav. What's your Tav, more or less? Um, your archaic was this, right? Um, that was your, I believe, like there's three different versions of Hebrew. Uh, that's not archaic. I forget which one that is. There may not even be an archaic. But it was represented by this, you know, your X. Um, which was what they were to write, the Tav. That angel was to mark those who had not bowed the knee to Baal, which takes us to Romans 11, right? Um, with this this mitochondrial. <laughs> and so the Hebrew letter Tav has the following meanings. One, it represents truth. Two, begins the word Tekan, if I'm saying that right, redemption, and refers to the concept of forgiveness. Three, symbolic of perfection as a final letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Four, also means mark, sign, and signature. Now, I've come up with a few passages with the wonder and the portent. I was looking at that verse, and I, I, it, it, I happened on it by chance again. 
Um, I wasn't looking for it, but we see the great wonder spoken of sitting opposite Joshua in uh, Zechariah chapter three, I believe it might be four. Um, it says from these, it says from these men, from these women will come the branch, right? Um, these are women, not men. These are women to be wondered at, wondered, right? Um, so I'm going to get, uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you that verse in a minute. If I remember where it is. Also means mark, sign, and signature. And five, in the word emmet, it represents truth. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's really incredible. So let me see if I can find that verse. Let me see. I'm just trying to remember. Right there. Right there. And I don't I, I don't remember how I hit on it. Uh, and it's it is speaking of the strong refuge as wisdom, I think. Um so it's found in Psalm seventy one seven. It says, My life is an example to many. Because you have been my strength and protection. But watch what it says. It says, um, I have become a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. So the strong refuge that you, you, um, you take your protection under is wisdom. You know you have the truth. You know it. That's your stronghold that you run into. And every time you think that, that you know, um, I'm being attacked, I don't know for certain that I have this truth. You you turn to wisdom and you just know you have it. It's like this is my this is my refuge. Reasoning is my refuge. Strength, um, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Um, no fear in that. You know this is my strong protection. But I I find it amazing that the sign I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge, and you know that sign is is that that, that this is your sign. You know, Emmet, mothers of truth. I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge. You, my mother. My mother. My life is an example to many because you have been my strength and my protection. Who? Wisdom, my mother. <laughs> she she gives us the glory. Right? We're told this in Proverbs. With wisdom we will make our war. With the counsel of many. And it's wisdom speaking to us as a wonder. I have become too many, you know, I have, but what's the word here? It's 4159, <laughs> sign, wonder, a wonder, a sign, a portent. And it's a, it's the word that appears, I, I believe it's the exact word that appears in Zechariah, these women of wonder, and it's women, it's not men. Symbol, miracle, wonders, marvels, token, God promised this. Yeah, it is, it's in Zechariah. Um, I just passed the the reference here. Um, well, my eye picked it up pretty quick. Now I can't locate it. Um, Zechariah three eight. It's got men who serve as a symbol or a sign. No, it's the women. It's the women of wonder in Zechariah three eight. From that, from this great bunch of women will come the branch. Yeah, and that's the 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 um, the scepter between Judah's feet, Shiloh. That's what it is. Miracle sign wondered at, or morpheth. I don't know if I'm saying that right. From yafa, in the sense of conspicuousness. A miracle, by implication, a token or omen. Miracle sign wondered at, a wonder, a great wonder. So, that you know, it does. It takes us back to these women marked with their mother's X chromosome. And the sons um, that don't bow to, to the the idol of a man, and they were there, according to the Bible, that fought against this idol as well. So I don't want to to negate that, um, you know, because we, we've done this study on Elijah um, that fought against uh, Baal. Gideon was another one. He fought against Baal, Baal in this covenant with el Bereth and baal Bereth. We've studied that covenant. It, it was the harlot's covenant, and it was husband's um, you know, the, the wicked Satan, you know, who wanted to rule over women. And, and so we, we do get men who, who does not capitulate to this wicked idea. 
Um, and so we know that it's Emmet. That sign is is Emmet. We just read it. It's it's amazing what the Lord will lead you to. Anyway, I'm sure I babbled long enough. So conceptual definitions of reincarnation. The word reincarnation derives from the Latin term that literally means entering the flesh again, reborn, rebirth, reborn. Oh, Pale in Genesis. That's where we were heading to next before we read this. So let's do that. Strong's Greek. That's what we want to do. Strong's Greek. Pale in Genesis. And it is Strong's Greek 3824. A new birth, regeneration, renewal. It's, it is, what is it? It was, I, I can't remember the words. Do you believe, metam, I want to put T there. Metam psychosis, it's the same, it's the same. Hail in Genesis, 3824, a new birth, regeneration, renewal, reincarnation. You're getting a new body. Oh, where's my pointer? Sorry. Birth. A new birth, because you're born again. <laughs> How are you born again? You're born again with a new body. A new baby. Baby body. A spiritual. Now, they say spiritual rebirth, is state or the act. Um. Excuse me, figuratively, spiritual renovation. So it's from Palin. What's that word? Back again. Again. Back. Um, more. Once more. Born again. See? Reincarnation is your concept under metempsychosis and reincarnation. And Genesis. <laughs> Well, so what does Genesis mean? Birth, lineage, descent, origin, birth, noun, feminine, not Jesus. Look at that. Um, and it's from, oh my gosh, I just seen this here. It's from this word. Genomai, genome, genealogy, birth. From genomai. I see my name in that. I come into being and born, yeah. Uh, I was going to look at that, I th think, at some point. Um, yeah, I come into being. I am born. I become. I come about. Reborn. You, you, you come into being. Yeah, yeah. So properly to emerge, become, transitioning from one point or realm and condition to another. Fundamentally means become, becoming became. So it is not an exact equivalent to the ordinary equivative verb to be. Is, was, and will be. Look at that. Which is what they always claim Jesus was. Jesus is, I, I, I was, I, I, I was that which is, was, and will be. And they always stick it on Jesus, right? And it's not confined to that. It's confined to the idea of reincarnation and coming around again. Um, to be reborn, to transform the renewing of your mind. So, I mean, you're promised, you know, when you come into being by transforming the way that you think, you, there's this promise of another body. There is. It's, it's there. And I couldn't help but see off to the side of, of um, my video, one of my videos that I, was, I happened to be watching today. There was this man that says, well, if I don't have the truth, truthful religion, then you're telling me I'm going to go to hell. No, that's what your religion tells you. I mean, come on, wake up. You know, it's like this, this catch-22 to everything out of their mouth. You know, it's like, again, you say your religion has to be the truth or otherwise you're going to hell. Well, it's your religion that teaches hell, but at the same time, you're, you're not paying attention. It does enforce the idea of a new body when you are seeking to follow the way of God and to find it. 
And so we're going to get into some ideas here of um, the wheel. Uh, and, and that's interesting because we currently have a new TV show. Well, it's not so new. Playing out, fictitious, called the Wheel of Time. And it's this idea that the wheel is actually the earth. And we already came to that understanding um, in Ezekiel when it speaks of the wheels. It's speaking of planets. It's speaking of heavenly bodies. Yeah, there's those out there that will say, no, no, that don't exist. Yeah, it does. That's what the wheels are speaking of in there. Um, and we studied it a long time ago. I would never find that video again. And it, it's telling you the wheel of time. The earth will put you out again. It, you know, you know, if, if you, um, it, and it's going to tell us what you do to, to bring about those new bodies for yourself. And again, I, I had speculated without even really reading this stuff. I had speculated it some time ago that based on what you do in this life will be determined in what portion of those mansions. And some are way better than others from the understanding um, that you, what you do in this life is going to determine where you go in the next life. So, you know, you kind of, it sounds crazy, but by seeking to find the deeper truths, you know, by, by actually determining to be transformed by the way that you think, you know, transform the way that you think and strive for the, for the, the higher thinking. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, you know. And it's so easy to do that because we're brainwashed into it. But that in some way, when you, you, you seek for that, that you actually are reserving a better place for yourself, for your, your new body to go. Yeah, and you are promised a new body. We're also going to get into the word dissolve in a minute after we read some of this stuff, so I better get along doing it. So reincarnation to the belief that an aspect of every human being or all living beings in some cultures continues to exist after death. Well, now we believe that because we believe the soul is eternal, don't we? We believe that the spirit is eternal. So this aspect may be the soul, mind, consciousness. Now we're told um, through the word, and I gave you the word, I don't remember the word that I, how long ago it's been, but I gave you the word that encompasses all of them and calls that the soul right? It refers to your, your mind, your spiritual emotions. I got it here somewhere if I can get that out of the way. That, that that's, they're all incorporated as your soul. And it's feminine. The noun was feminine. Okay, I must be getting close to it. It's there. I said, oh, it's going to do it for you. And I did. I gave you the word. Um, come on. But um, it was a Greek word that we hit on, and it did so mean um, your mind, your your soul, and your 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 spirit all in one. Um, and that's what this is kind of saying. This aspect may be the soul, mind, consciousness, the soul, mind, and consciousness which is all defined as your spirit, in, according to that word, which I can't find right now. Or something um, transcendent, which is reborn in an interconnected cycle of existence. Yeah, that would be eternal, wouldn't it? The transmigration belief varies by culture and is envisioned to be in the form of a newly born human being. Absolutely, that's what we're told. Um animal, plant, spirit, or as being in some other non-human realm of existence. Well, now we don't, they don't teach that to us in Christianity. They teach us that we move from one body, physical human being, and it's generally your gender to another body. Um, an alternative term is transmigration, implying migration from one, one life body to another. Transmigration, remember, was the same as um, which was your term for metempsychosis, which was the same as um, or equivalent to palingenesis, which is the word we were just looking at in Strong's Greek. So an alternative term is transmigration, implying transmigration from implying migration from one life body to another. The term has been used by modern philosophers, um, and we can get into that, but we're not. We're going to go again. And 
we're going to keep reading down further. Um, so the Greek equivalent to reincarnation, metempsychosis, derives from meta, change, and imp, psychon, to put a soul into, a term attributed to Pythagoras, another Greek term sometimes used synonymously, synonymously, is palingenesis, meaning being born again. So rebirth is a key concept found in, a, in major Indian religions. So we're going to take a look at these um, and discuss this using various terms, um, reincarnation. So I'm going to move down because I kind of uh, highlighted what I wanted to. Because one of these has the wheel in it, maybe this part here. These religions believe that this reincarnation is cyclic. In an endless, and this is the word they use, samsara or samsara, unless one gains, now get this, this is important because this is where we're heading, unless one gains spiritual insights that ends this cycle leading to liberation, right? These religions believe that this reincarnation is cyclic in an endless samsara, unless one gains spiritual insight that ends the cycle leading to liberation. So I'm tending to think that, you know, this earth will spit you out again and again and again here to relive this life here again and again in, in various capacities. It's you, but you're, you're living it, I don't know, probably in various parts of this world, either in better parts, worse parts of the earth. But there is a chance that, the world could um, undergo such a transformative change that there would be no life left on it, and therefore there would be no one here to produce a new body for you to come out in. So that could be the meaning of the dissolving of the soul and why you gave only so many chances to come to that, till one gains that spiritual insight that ends a cycle leading to liberation, which means that you do actually go out into an eternal body that you're no longer kicked out um, for these short cycles of life that we live here, which is akin to um, the womb of Sheol and, and this death cycle that we're kind of in. When you come to that higher understanding is your idea, when we gain that deeper insight, the spiritual insight, it ends this cycle leading to our liberation, and we go into that final perfect body where we don't have to worry about, you know, happening to be provided with a new body on and on and on. So there's that promise there that you do, you know, you can attain to a body that is an actual eternal body, and it exists in the spiritual world, this eternal body does. So the reincarnation concept, now that's what I'm taking away from it for now. Um, I'm sure we're, we all have slightly different insights into that, but that's the one I'm getting right now. So the reincarnation concept is considered in Indian religions as a step that starts each cycle of aimless, drifting, wandering, or mundane existence. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel that way. Um, you do wander aimlessly. Uh, that's why a lot ends up in religion um, with this promise of... Uh, uh, you know, a future rebirth of eternal life, but you do not reach it without um, gaining the spiritual insights that leads to your absolute liberation. And so, but one that is an opportunity to seek spiritual liberation through ethical living and a variety of meditative, um, they got marga, yogic, or other spiritual practices. They consider the release from the cycle of reincarnation as the ultimate spiritual goal and call the liberation by terms such as moksha, nirvana, um, and however the Buddhists, and they got other words there that I'm not even going to say, however the Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain traditions have differed uh, since ancient times in their assumptions and in their details on what reincarnates, how reincarnation occurs, and what leads to liberation. Um, let me see. So, yeah, they have um, um, Gilgal. So we're going to the Jews on this. 
Um, Gilgal means cycle, and Nashamat is souls. Kabbalistic reincarnation says that humans reincarnate only to humans, unless Yahweh or God chooses. Um, so let's see where else we can go on this. Um, early Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. So this is where we're going to get the wheel that kicks you out. Let me see here. So I, I tend to think that, what was the writer's name? Uh, Robert Jordan, who wrote The Wheel of Time. Um, so he was, uh, I think he was into all of these various religions and of course made up the premise of that ideal wheel of time. Uh, he certainly was delved into Buddhism and and um, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. He was certainly um, deep into these traditions that they held um, because um, we speak of the wheel in these particular ones, um, and it's all to do with the transmigration, um, the rebirth of the soul into a new body, uh, which is the same as palingenesis, metempsychosis. So we are hitting all on the same, you know, basic principle of of um of having a rebirth, and that is to to transmigrate this soul, the spirit, the mind. Which then it tells us that you don't always carry your memories over, that you don't always remember your previous life. Um, so let's just uh, pick it up. The Jaina philosophy assumes that the soul or jiva, jiva in Jainism or the Atman in Hinduism exists and is eternal, passing through tr cycles of transmigration and rebirth. Um, now, you know, you, you have dreams and you have visions sometimes, but I can't help but think that my, my dreams that I have had, and they, they are, you know, I, I can put a number on them. They're not a lot. But that I can kind of validate this idea that we do so live prior existence because I had a strong feeling that these were memories from prior existence that I had had. And that's the only thing that I can use to, to validate that I do believe there's truth to this. That I myself seen those and I can't help but think that I was reliving memories somehow that I was not supposed to be able to, to get a hold of. Or I was, you know, maybe they were being funneled to me for a reason. Um, so from uh, likely from the last centuries of the first millennial BCE and extensively mentions rebirth and karma doctrines. The Jaina philosophy assumes that the soul exists and is eternal, passing through cycles of transmigration and rebirth. After death, reincarnation into a new body is asserted to be instantaneous in the early Jaina texts. So depending upon the accumulated karma, rebirths occur into a higher or lower bodily form. So this take, takes me to the idea that it depends on where you go. Um, and, and so we can think of it, you know, it also comes down, sort of, there's another level there uh, yet again, that if we do attain to that higher next level that we do actually go out as opposed to staying here in the womb of Sheol to continue reliving that existence till we get something right up here in our thoughts. Then we go out there. So again, there's other levels out there yet again, based on, you know, that truth that we kind of come to. Um, now that's just a new thought. So one that needs more exploring, and I'm sure if there's any truth to it, the spirit will kind of lead that in, lead me in that. So after death, reincarnation into a new body is asserted to be instantaneous. So depending on the accumulated karma, rebirth occurs into a higher or lower bodily form, either in heaven or hell or earthly realm. Um, so hell is completely a made-up term from the Greek, and I think they actually took it from um, what took place in Daniel too. Because in Christianity, we are threatened with hellfire. We're going to burn for eternity in hell's fire if we don't bow to this king and God. Well, that takes us right back to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar when he made this golden idol of a man, a king, and said, if you don't bow to me, I'm going to heat the furnace seven times hot and you're going to burn in hell's fire for not bowing to me. So it's the same kind of concept. So I don't tend to think it's about 
hell so much as the dissolving of your spirit if you don't um in a sense kind of prove that you're able to you know surpass these lower forms of thinking which leads to the violence which leads to bloodshed which leads to all these nasties so it is a form of testing you know and you can pass it or you can fail it so depending upon the accumulated karma rebirth occurs into a higher or lower bodily form either in heaven or in the earthly realm that's what i'm going to say because hell is you know is sheol um which is a it's not the greek concept hell is the greek concept hades is the greek concept sheol is the hebrew concept and it's very different in nature very different so no bodily form is permanent everyone dies and reincarnates further liberation from reincarnation is possible it's possible be, to be liberated from reincarnation however through removing and ending karmic accumulations to one's soul from the early stages of jainism on a human being was considered the highest mortal being with the potential to achieve liberation particularly through asceticism i can't say that word um and i'm not going to look that up cuz we're just going to keep reading so um some of them says that it means that once you reach the that higher level of liberation that you will no longer be reincarnated that um almost to the idea you will no longer cease to exist because existing eternally in this capacity is a hell in itself sort of uh, is their idea so the early buddhist text discusses rebirth as part of the doctrine of samsara this asserts that the nature of existence is a suffering laden cycle of life death and rebirth without beginning or end um so that's a real morbid take on it um you know i had i had come up against a wall on that one some time ago um that there are people that comes to this enlightened understanding and they just kind of don't know where to go from there and it kind of leaves them like you know with a you know i i i see hope in that i do i see hope in bettering um this bettering this and um so i don't tend to think that it's necessarily laden cycle of life death and rebirth without beginning or end is necessarily a bad thing um i think the bad thing is those who wants to screw this up screw this cycle up by throwing in a lot that they were not supposed to put in there by throwing in bloodshed hate and all those things they have really screwed up this cycle of life death and rebirth without beginning or end for a lot of us and that was their intention so also referred to as the wheel of existence it is see there's the wheel of existence it is often mentioned in buddhist texts with the term i can't say that puna bara bhava rebirth and rebecoming there it is i had looked this word up uh rebecoming is it still there anyway we just looked at it All right um so it was genome there it is yeah so again you know what what did it say it's his buddhist text with the term i can't say the word rebirth or re becoming and so we do get that understanding from this word uh genome which is 1096 and it means to co- i come into being i am born i become i come about i happen um so what did it say properly emerging to emerge become transitioning from one point realm condition to another fundamentally means become becoming became means to become and signifies a change of condition state or place means to come into being manifestation implying motion movement or growth growth a liberation yeah thus it is used for god's action as emerging from eternity and becoming showing themselves in time and physical space wow <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of words there um that it means so i'm not going to wow is that long i didn't realize it had so much information so be brought to pass happen um cause to be to become come into being 
Um, so, I mean, it, it's there. You know, the understanding is all, you know, there in the text. The men on the pulpit don't teach us, but it doesn't mean it's not there in the text, because it is so there in the text. Um, for some reason, they don't want to show you that. They want to keep harping at uh, the made-up idea that you'll burn in an eternal hell if you don't bow down to this king and God, which really was just simply taken by the Greeks from from my understanding. You know, Hades, the Greek concept of Hades really come from the book of Daniel, from what I can, you know, piece together. Now, of course, it goes back further than that, I'm sure, but it, it all goes back to the same place, to the liars who want it to, to screw up the cycle of life, death, and rebirth without beginning and end for the lot of us. And so they say, with the womb of Sheol, are we at agreement? <laughs> you know, we're going to screw this up as good as we can. So, um, what else do we want to read? Um, the vast majority of contemporary lay Buddhists focus on accumulating good karma and acquiring merit to achieve a better reincarnation in the next life. That's what we're, that's what you're to struggle for. You know, it is. Um, in Buddhist tradition, samsara cosmology consists of five realms through which the wheel of existence cycled. This included hells, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, and gods. I, um, not sure how I feel about that one. I almost think that that probably came off of Bale's tongue, some of it. Um, again, wanting to screw up this cycle of eternal existence for us. And yet we get a liberation, um, you know, once we pass through this cycle of lies and liberate our minds in the way that we think we are able to fulfill, um, you know, a better existence for all of us. So, um, let me see. There was another part here I wanted to read. I think I was re reading it earlier um, today, but it is hard to remember. Um, uh, yeah, I know what it was that I wanted to read. It was about uh, origin. Oregon, uh, I don't know how you'd say his name. He's the one that's credited with um, writing the Latin Vulgate. And uh, they claim that he did so validate the whole idea of transmigration of the soul, of metempsychosis, and that they removed it. They removed the letters that um, one guy actually translated off of his original text and the guy who had gotten him to translate the text just after he got the translation, he just said, oh, never mind, and kind of threw it away. So I don't know why why it was so important that they throw that away, other than the fact that they were working really hard to throw up, to screw up this wheel of time to create the violence of bloodshed against those of us who, you know, we were living good lives, uh, and they didn't want that. So. We're going to go under, because uh, we're going to hit him here somewhere, in Buddhism now, religions and philosophies, Buddhism. According to various Buddhist scriptures, Gautama, Buddha, believed in the existence of an afterlife in another world and in reincarnation. Since there actually is another world, any world other than the present human one, i.e. different rebirth realms, one who holds the view there is no other world, has wrong view. So the Buddha also asserts that karma influences rebirth and that the cycles of repeated births and deaths are endless. Before the birth of Buddha, ancient Indian scholars had developed competing theories of afterlife, including the materialistic school such as Charvaka, um, which posited that death is the end. There is no afterlife, no soul, no rebirth, no karma. And they describe death to be a state where a living being is completely annihilated and dissolved. So we're going to hit on this one right now. Buddha rejected this theory, adopted the alternative existing theories on rebirth, criticizing the materialistic schools that denied rebirth and karma, states Damien Kion. 
Such beliefs are inappropriate and dangerous, stated Buddha, because such annihilationism views encourage moral irresponsibility and material hedonism. He tied moral responsibility to rebirth, and it is. But you know what? Um, I can't help but think the pursuit of uh, a, an AI body. Now, years ago, I recall reading, and most of you here probably read this stuff the same, probably the same time I did, that they were seeking, um, you know, a body, an AI body, a created ma body by man himself, made out of a machine, that you could literally, this is what they were saying, you could literally down soul, download your soul into or your spirit into it. And that takes us back to what they were doing to, you know, against the women in the Old Testament. They would really want it to get rid of the women. And you can't help but, you know, look at this robot that they call Sophia. Sophia is another name for wisdom. It means wisdom, the name translates to. Why would they want to make that a robotic thing, female? And, and really try to push this idea that female is robotic in some way. Um, because man wants to replace woman's ability to create a body in that cycle of eternal life and get rid of her because he wants all power, all glory unto himself. You can't help but see this in the AI world, really. And it's the men at the top of the chain of command who's really pushing this forward um, so that they, they think that they don't need women who are the ones that do actually provide the new body um, for the spirit and soul to be downloaded into. Um, but there's some idea that the, that piece of machinery can't really hold the spirit in the body, that there is some sense of that it is annihilated and that it is dissolved because those bodies are, those bodies of, um, you know, AI are not, create it to hold the spirit they're not designed to do that it takes a woman and they don't like that they don't like her having that power it really burns them but we're going to get this this word because we get this word annihilate and dissolve and we do so get it in context of the wicked that god promises to dissolve and melt so there is this testing. There is an understanding. Where Now, what did I do with it? There is this idea. I thought I stuck it on the end here. So there is this idea of a testing, you know, that you, you do have to prove yourself worthy, um, that you're not going to create violence, which is why the men are seeking so hard to find you know, like these replacement bodies made of machine. Well, now it is so there. I sorry. There it is. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to backtrack on the word so I can pull up the actual verse that it's found in. So it is Psalm 68 too, and God says this. Watch this. May you blow them away like smoke, as wax melts, and that's the word we want to look at, melts. Before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. So let's go in and look that one up. Melt. Melts. Four, five, four, nine. Strong's Hebrew, four, five, four, nine. Masas. To dissolve. Melt. What is God saying? You know, if if you don't watch your tests, <laughs> completely lose heart, drenched, dropped, melt, melt away, melting, melts, waste away, you're worthless. <laughs> um. So the words I have, the word I have, the meanings. I'll write them down. Go ahead here. Let me see. Where is it? Where is it? Because I do have it. Oh, I was just reading it. Oh my gosh. Sorry, folks. Uh, uh, it's here. 
Okay, so I went ahead when I should have went back. Right there. Yeah. To dissolve, melt, vanish. That's there. Worthless. Literally, you are rejected. You see what the problem is? Why they hate women so much? They don't want women having the ability to reject you when you create bloodshed and wickedness and, and, and being partiality in the law that you set for yourselves versus her. And you don't like the right that she has the power to either reject you or give you a new body. So this is why the AI idea starts to really validate this whole entire belief and this whole entire concept of, you know, transmigration of the soul, rebirth, regeneration, palingenesis, and metempsychosis. It's absolutely seems to be at the core of the belief of, of why they're trying to generate you know, a robotic body um, that they can transfer your your soul, your spirit into. And and because, what does it say? It says the kings are trapped in the womb of Sheol. They can't get out of it because she refuses to give them a new body because they're wicked. They want to shed blood. They're doing horrible things and they're making it horrible for everybody else in this existence. I mean, they're just not, they're not worth having around. You know, that's why it says worthless, melt away, um, dissolve, vanished, literally rejected. And they don't like that. They don't like her having that power. They don't. That is part of the attack against the woman. All right. Okay, so we're, we've covered that. I'm not going to go into too much more detail on that because, um, wow, it's really interesting. Um, I should maybe make a note, though, because we are going to pick the topic up again at some future point, and I'd like to make sure that I know where I stopped on um, reincarnation. And and we may pick it up in, in a further investigation of the topic. All right. So reincarnation. And I stopped at um, the Buddha. The Buddha. And um, so we'll take a further look at the topic here. So I have reincarnation pulled up. I had reincarnation pulled up again. I had it pulled up twice. And I had... Okay, I know why. Because I, yeah, let's let's just look at origin. I don't know how to say his name, but he's the one that's responsible for the Latin Vulgate. So, under the impression that origin or organ was a heretic, like Arius, Saint Jerome criticizes ideas described in on the first principles. Now, wait a second. Um. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to backtrack on this because I'm too far down. There is evidence, okay, that origin or organ, I, I don't know if the G is hard or soft, so uh, it's origin, O-R-I-G-E-N, anybody who knows the Latin Vulgate, you know his name. So there is evidence that origin, a church father in early Christian times, taught reincarnation in his lifetime. But that when his works were translated into Latin, these references were concealed. One of the epistles written by St. Jerome to Avitus, letter 124, ad avitum, epistula, and I don't know what that number is. I don't, I can't remember what C is. It's C50, um, so 50, 60, 74. Um, I don't know if the C is 50. I can't remember. Where is it? 20 or 30, I can't remember, which asserts that origins on the first principle was mistranscribed. So about 10 years ago, that saintly man, Pamachius, sent me a copy of a certain person's, Rufinus's, rendering, or rather misrendering, of origins first principles, with a request that in a Latin version, I should give the true sense of the Greek and should set down the writer's words for good or for evil. Maybe I got. Maybe it wasn't the Latin Vulgate. Maybe it was um, the Septuagint. 
that he translated. I you know Septuagint means seventy. Um, which was the seventy that translated it? So, yeah, I'm sure he was with the Latin Vulgate. So sense of the Greek and should set down the writer's words for good or for evil without bias in either direction. When I did as he wished and sent him the book, he was shocked to read it and locked it up in his desk, lest being circulated it might wound the souls of many. <laughs> Under the impression that Origen was a heretic like Arius, St. Jerome criticizes ideas described in On the First Principles. I, I might have to pull that out. Further into Evitas, St. Jerome writes about convincing proof that Origen teaches reincarnation in the original version of the book. The following passage is a convincing proof that he holds the transmigration of souls and annihilation of bodies. If it can be shown that an incorporeal and reasonable being has life in itself independently of the body, and that it is worse off in the body than out of it, then beyond a doubt bodies are only of secondary importance and arises from time to time to meet the varying conditions of reasonable creatures. Those who require bodies are clothed with them, and contrary wise. When fallen souls have lifted themselves up to better things, their bodies are once more annihilated. They are thus ever vanishing and ever reappearing. The original text of On First Principles has almost completely disappeared. It remains extant as the Principes and Fragments faithfully translated into Latin by St. Jerome and in the not very reliable Latin translation of Rufinus. Reincarnation was also taught by seven Gnostics, such as Marcion of Sinope, and belief in reincarnation was rejected by Augustine of Hippo in the City of God. So, we see them actually trying to bury this idea. We do. Um, so I'm also going to make a note here. Drew's is where next. Um, and this under Buddha. So um, we may pick that up again. Um, I'm going to leave it behind for now. Okay. So, but, um, you know, we get uh, other passages dealing with um, the spirit when it leaves the body in some sense being light. Right. And so that's why you want to read the transforming of your mind. It, it does. It leads to enlightenment. Right. Uh, a higher spiritual form. Um, I just read it. Where was it? Okay, it's back. I marked it. Where is it? Right there. Well, I say I marked it. Where is it? I took my paper out. Ah. Okay. But it was um, Romans 12, 2. You know, be not conformed to the thinking of this world. Um, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. And and you can say, well, this is a custom. Most of us are in religion that doesn't teach this particular custom. It does not. And yet it is in there. You know, that understanding of, of, of cycling out and, and, and moving to a better position in the next life based on what you do with this one and how you think. Um, and it's provided by the mother who said, you taught yourself you didn't have to fear me. And the men have so much bloody pride that they want to have this understanding, hey, we can provide ourselves with a body, even if it's made out of, you know, machine, um, is the idea. And it is validated in this very existence. It's, that's exactly the power that they want. You know, and but you also get the those women who sew, sewed handkerchiefs, you know, to to the armholes to make the spirit fly. And so we get God in, and it is God, in um, Psalm 18. And this is a re repeat chapter. Psalm 18 is the same as 2 Samuel 22. 
and it says, And she rode, not he, she rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, she did fly upon the wings of the wind. Well, this is what we discover when we study further. I have it here. So, uh, in Psalm 104, verse 3, we get um, figurative of the dawn. So, let's, um, oops, let me go to that. Let's go to Psalm 104 and see if we can grasp this concept. Not sure that we will be able to, because I don't exactly remember what this verse is. So Psalm 104, verse 3. Who layeth the beams of her chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds her chariot? And who walketh upon, this is it, the wings of the wind, right? The wings of the wind, spirit. The wings of the spirit. So it's figurative of the dawn. In, in brackets, it's got winged sun disk, com, uh, question mark. Psalm 139.9, compare of son of righteousness, right? The son, S-U-N, not a, a male. The son of righteousness, um, which we, we link it all to the false light shining upon the Shulamite. Um, it, it all comes back to being illuminated. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, so that, that's Psalm 139.9, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, that's the doe of the dawn. Um, in Psalm 22, um, and she says, my lure, my lyre will awaken the dawn. So it's the doe of the dawn speaking there. If I settle on the far side of the sea, you know, it's, it's about illuminating your mind. Um, that's going to transform you into this light. And when we leave these bodies, we the idea is that we travel on on the wings of the wind, the wings of the spirit. Um, is there? Um, it it's quite amazing. And then we get we'll throw this in. Um, where is it? Yeah, that's amazing. Kamas, Strong Hebrew 4647, stored up in my memory. You know, is it not laid up in store with me, sealed up in my memories? Um, so that's Deuteronomy 32, 34. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of all over the place here. But I'm going to Psalm, I think it's Psalm 9. Isaiah 9? Just a second. I need to locate this because I do have it. Yeah, and also I just was there. Job. Yeah, and this has to do with your body as well. Okay, so we're going to go to Job. I did mark that, but I'll never locate it. Okay, so Job 24. Is where we're heading to right now. Right there. So Job 24, verse, let me see, verse 10 to 12. So watch this. And how this is all connected to the God making an accusation. She actually has to bring her case forward in order to be able to bring forth a new body because watch what it's it's referencing here in Job 24 verses 10 to 12. They cause her to go naked. What does it mean to be naked? It means not to be appareled with a body. Um, so they cause her, it's got him in, in italicized, so it's mean it's imposed on the text. So I'm going to just simply put in she. So they cause her to go naked without clothing and they take away the sheaf from the hungry which make oil within their walls and tread their wine presses and suffer thirst. Men, women, groan from out of the city and the soul of the wounded crieth out. Yet God layeth not folly to them. Doesn't lay a charge against them. Now we know she's absolutely got to bring forth her case in order for us to be liberated. Right? liberated into an eternal body. And um, 
So once you bring forth that charge, she's able to reshape this existence. And when she's able to reshape this existence, she changes this cycle of life, of, of life of rebirth and death and rebirth and death into a much better existence is the idea. So we know that in, um, look, there's my mini, mini magnifying glass stuck there. Why do I have it there? Um, what was I saying? Um, Life not folly to them. So when we go to Psalm 50, or 55, I'm sure now it's 50. <laughs> I'm sure it's Psalm, rather, and not Isaiah. So I believe it's Psalm 50. Um, to declare my statutes, yeah. Um, so seest that you hatest instruction, castest my words behind thee. So always in context with her, she's behind him. She's been cast behind him. He's not listening to her. And yet God will say, and I forget the passage. I just was, I just had found it not long ago, just, just before I turned on my camera. And it says, you hear a voice from behind you. It says, this is the way I walk ye in, in this pathway. And it's the voice of these daughters that he's cast behind himself and he's not listening to her. And so we often get her in context with she's been cast behind him because he's too busy walking out in front playing God. To, but yet um, she says, you hear the voice from behind you saying, this is the way I walk ye in it, right? And, and it, she's always in context of behind, behind, behind. You cast her behind you and you won't listen to me. So the voice of her comes from behind him. And but we get her seeing thou hatest instruction, my law. You hate it, my law. And you cast us my words behind you, you won't listen to me. So when thou sawest the thief, then thou consentest with him, and has been partakers with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against not thy brother, your sister. You spoke against your own sister. You slanderest thine own mother's daughter. And that's who he slandered because he wanted to get control of that law. He did. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as yourself, but I will reprove you and set them in order before your very eyes. Now consider this, you that have forgotten God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. So it says, God you know, brings a charge against nobody. She, God, we know, was the presence of God on this earth was the camp of Mahainim that you see with the Shulamite. We discussed it in the last video. So she absolutely has to bring him into account to change, um, you know, to, to be able to form man into the creature that he was always meant to be. And when she's able to do that, then she takes back control of her very own law system well, that's what this is all about, the branch coming forth. And when she's able to do that, she changes the eternal existence, is kind of the idea that I'm picking up on. Now, I also spoke on uh, in that video that I had promised, I was going to show you where um, the seraphim is, uh, I, is presented as female, really. Um, so, and not only that, but we also... Let me let me go there. Let's see, if it's Isaiah nine. I think it's Isaiah nine. It's um. I don't think it's Psalm nine. No, it's not. I know. I know now. It is Isaiah nine. So let's uh, go quickly to Isaiah nine. This is an important verse. So what does it say? There. Yeah. Verse 2, Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. <laughs> They're illuminated with the truth. They that dwell in the land of the shadows of death. Um, upon them had the light shined. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's all interconnected, this um, truth. Now, where was I going? Oh, I can't remember now. 
Oh, yeah, we got to actually pull this up here. So we're going to go to Ezekiel. Uh, verse, oh, let's see if it's smart enough. Um, oh, stop it. So this is concerning the heavenly authority. And you're going to find that in Ezekiel 1, 9 to 12. We're going to go there just to take a quick look at um, the cherubim, which is also the seraphim eventually. So, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Now, what you understand here is, is you know, we were not to make um, either idol, male or female, or an animal. Um, to bow down to and worship. What happened is when the Israelites come out of the land of Egypt, they end up making a bull god, a calf god, which is male there, which they were warned not to do, which eventually turns into a male idol standing, which you were not to have these, these images and idols before you, neither male nor female or an animal. So in order for us to understand what they were actually trying to cover over, we needed to understand what the animals meant in allegory. All right. So we do have to continue to speak in those terms of animal and uh, which was Aid, idolatry that God was totally warning us not to do. So in this case, when we're identifying the cherubim and the seraphim and who they exist, represent, they're representing the nation of Israel in allegory. And when you read about the seraphim's feet, they have the feet of a calf. They do. But it's the heifer that's in view there, which is a representation of the nation of Israel. And it's red. It has a bronze red color. So we know it's the red heifer kind of in your allegory there to some degree. Now, I know there's more there. Okay, I didn't actually go in and look relook at that information. We also, right quick, years ago we discovered that there were not just, um, oh, maybe I better not talk on it. Um, but there's not just 12 uh, doors with uh, these uh, pearls. There's actually 36 doors because 24 doors got closed up. Those were your women, your wise women. Yeah. That. Um, so we know that there's actually 36 because it says, yeah, that's what it. Every every several door was one of pearl. When you look at Current day Jerusalem, uh, you know, at one time they're shown as having, what is it, 12, maybe only four now, entrance ways. But that was what I think Solomon was up to doing when he walled up the breaches of David. The, wall, the breaches that he was walling up was the gateway of these wise daughters. And he was actually bearing that information um, that there was an actual extra 24 gateways um, that these daughters walked in because she has a double portion right we see the sons with the x y so they get one portion the da daughters have x x they have a double portion so we see the 12 gates in new new jerusalem and there's there's really every several gate is one of solid pearl and um but then we get these 24 extra gates so anyway but we discovered that right most don't don't realize that that there's not twelve gates in New Jerusalem. There's actually thirty six, and they were for the women. They were for the wise women. Um, so, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. So this is concerning the cherubim. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. So they're kind of moving in a a solid unit. Is your idea? So let's just look up a couple of words here and see why we might understand this as a feminine and not a masculine. So uh, wings one. Let's let's look at that word one in a Strong's Hebrew eight o two. Guess what that one says there? Eight o two. Noun feminine. Woman. Wife. Female. Oh my gosh, what the frig is that doing there? We're talking about the cherubim, which is a representation of the nation of Israel. Yes, the feminine aspect, just like the seraphim does. Isha. Yeah. Woman, wife, female. Yeah. There, there you go. Look at that. 
That's Ezekiel 1, uh, verse 9. And another, one to another. So this is your twin and your double, and it's also the wings, which is a symbol of heavenly authority, spiritual authority is what that is. So the another is 269. Um, I don't know how to say this word. A cough, a cough, a chaff. I think it's a cough, but maybe I'm wrong. Noun feminine, it means sister. Look at that, sister. So it, it takes me back to the idea in Daniel where one is calling to another over the water. You know, that, you know, speaking to one another. <laughs> yeah, there's a spirit upon us, but it is heavenly authority ordained. Uh, these are the elect. They're pulling out the elect daughters. Um, and we are going to show ourselves to be great wonders by the things that we show you. And if you are willing to bank your pride or get rid of your pride, you'll come to this greater knowledge and greater understanding and help build a better future for us all to exist in, um, in this life and in the next. So, you know, there is this idea that we are going to dissolve the wicked. We're going to melt them away. After the testing, they have to be tested. She says to her daughters in Jeremiah, I forget the chapter she says it in, it may be four, five. She says, for what else can I do for the dear daughter of my people but to test their ways, try their ways on earth? So you are gave a sad time that you are tried and tested. Yeah. Um, so I, I know I didn't cover everything. I promised you that I would. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, again, Isaiah 59 validates this as well, that a cobweb of lies produces nobody that can sustain you. Um, I got my Bible, found my Bible. Um, I was hiding behind one of my chairs, believe it or not. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of a storage space behind one of my chairs. Okay, so 59. Um, let me see here. Yeah, do I not have my magnifying glass? It's hard. It, the light ain't right enough here. Um. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid her face from you, and she will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness, stupid things, the harlot's romance, <laughs> and Baal's desire to be worshipped. Um... For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquities. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue have muttered, have muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice. See, God does not um, lay a charge against anybody. And she has to do that. Absolutely has to do that in order to produce a body that does hold together. So none calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and idols, male idols, and speak lies. They conceive mischief, mischief and they bring forth wind. That takes us back to the daughter Zion. We have not wrought a deliverance in the earth. We have, as it were, brought forth wind, empty doctrines. 417, strong, strong Greek. You're not going to get your understanding there in the Hebrew. It won't give it. It'll give you 7307 as a word, and it means spirit, wind. But it will not give you the the figurative meaning. You actually have to go to the Strong's Greek 417. And I repeat this for anybody who's just watching this, who's forgotten these details. I will continue to reiterate it as much as I can. So they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They have They hatch cockatrice eggs. And weave the spider's web. Um, he that eateth of their eggs dieth, she that eateth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become 
garments. What's the web allegorical to? A web of lies. And what's a web? It's a flimsy thing that cannot hold the spirit. The it, it dissolves. It melts. Perhaps is also your idea causes the spirit to fly. Uh, they're so in pillows to the armholes of the real bodies that will maybe hold together. I don't know. Um, their web shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the acts of violence is in their hands. So there is a set time of testing. Um, and you're going to be judged on how well you do in this test. <laughs> you are. And some, according to that, the wicked will be melted, vanished, dissolved. Um, uh, what was it? What did we say? Literally reject it. And we see the desperation of those boys, those kings trapped in the womb of Sheol, uh, struggling and fighting desperately hard to create some kind of body uh, not made out of the things that God can produce birth a new body for you. Um, they can't do that. But they're desperately trying to achieve that same act of creation that she um, is gifted with and has always had. And so she has the ability to literally reject you. And 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 mother says, and I have I have absolutely attributed it to the mother that was denied. She says, You told yourself you didn't have to fear me. You had no reason to fear me. Well, guess what? You forgot I'm the one that determines who gets a new body. It is not Father that creates the body, it is me. And you see them in desperately scrambling to create some form of a made up, make fake body. And then try to tell you that you can, guess what? You can um, download your soul, your spirit, your mind into this machine. Um, and yet there's still some idea that it can't hold you. Over time, your body, your your spirit, your, your spirit will absolutely literally dissolve away from that fakeness. It's not from God. It's not of God. And there's a desperation there that you can see in, in, in this current world. Um, it's really trying hard um, to deny the creator, the mother, the one that can give you a new body, rebirth you into a new body. Um, but she says, for what else can I do for the dear daughter of my people but try their ways upon the earth? We are being tested. And it is about the transmigration of the soul, metempsychosis, reincarnation. And uh, they have really fought to suppress that information. And they have fought for a reason to suppress it, I think. Um, so anyway, there's our video. I apologize if I forgot anything I promised that I would bring up in this video. Um, I tried to take the notes. Um, it actually, I don't know. In the rewatch, I may decide I hate it. Um, but transform strong Greek three 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 nine three 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 nine strong Greek renewing three forty two renewal completing a process um make fresh new it's just uh it's it's a fascinating topic when we really get into it isaiah twenty nine twenty the ruthless will vanish, the mockers will disappear, and all who have an eye for evil will be cut down. You will not have a new body. You're being tested. You are. Um, may you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. Psalm 68, 2. Um, you know, so if you're being tested, you know, do you think God just randomly says, oh, well, I'm going to cut you away because you didn't receive Jesus? And No, God's going to cut you away based on how well you follow those laws. Though you may not even know that you're following those laws. Of being decent, of not wanting bloodshed, of not wanting violence, and just just following those ways. And do you really think God's going to cut you away if you are a peaceful sort of soul um, who wants to allow people to, to live a peaceful existence and, and to um, further their own personal education um on on you know producing things that's right in this existence each existence i know i'm i sound like i'm talking foolishness but do you think god 
you know, is going to randomly cut you away? Or do you think after testing you time and maybe time again, that you keep yielding up the same violence, the same bloodshed, the same idea that, um, you know, that there's this male God that gives man the right to beat a woman around, say, and you can say, well, that doesn't exist. It exists in all the religions. Christianity has many, um, you know, many attestations over time of the men who just thought that it was their, their right to beat a woman into submission and to make her submit to his laws. Well, you think you aren't being judged for that. Well, you're being judged for, for each time, if, you know, whatever those times may be. You know, if you're a peaceful soul who respects another soul, another life, and, and actually kind of ends up being helpful to each other in these exit, you're being judged on those things. And they'll say, it's not by your works, it's by your faith. No, it ain't. No, it is not. It is not. God says, for what else can I do but try their ways upon this earth for the dear daughter of my people and for what you did to her? Um, you just, you're cowards. You know, the truth is not for the cowardly and the timid. You know, what that means is you are already faithless when you refuse to listen to another idea to expand on the ideas of the word. You're already faithless. You have already proved that you have no faith. And if you don't understand why I'm saying that, then you don't understand much. You must not really have a whole lot of faith in here if you're so certain that listening to what I have to say is going to take that right down from you. And yet your ears is allegorical to scales, weighing up what you hear. Well, how can you weigh up what you hear if you won't even listen? That's how faithless you are. You, you already believe your faith is weak and it will fall if you listen. And, and it actually makes sense to you, which is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to reason. Now, I didn't have anybody else to really listen to and weigh it up. So I, I, I realized now over the years I was actually weighing up what the men were saying on the pulpit, and it just simply wasn't weighing up. It was not reasoning out. Not for me. It simply wasn't. And so if, if they won't, you know, and you're not even going to hear me say this, but if you won't even listen to anything I have to say, then at least weigh up what they're saying on the pulpit. Does it reason? And, and a father, male and male, that created me did not reason. It did not, and it never will. But they are trying to make it make sense because they want to, to come up with a right to, to get rid of all the females because they hate us, at least those at the top do. They've proven that they do. And to try to take the right of, of the creative process away from the woman, which they can't do. <laughs> they never will be able to do that. Because she, she's existed before the beginning of time. She's because we exist. Why we exist. And uh, anyway, so there's a discussion on it. Um, I hope it makes some kind of sense. We're just going to continue to discuss this topic off and on in whatever other topics that we we feel we need to or want to, are interested in studying and furthering our understanding on it. So I thank you for watching my videos. I thank all my subscribers, all my commentaries, com commenters, sorry, making comments. Uh, I thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the reason why I shut my commentary section, comment section, off on my final video on Ruth Abbey is because somehow a, a lady got on, I think it's a lady or a man pretending to be a lady, um, got on and made a comment and what aggravated me was that there was no indication that she was even there. There was no warning on the inside of my channel where you're supposed to get all these, you know, comments to either allow them ahead or you can even remove them if you choose to. And that option had never even been gave to me. I didn't even know she was there until five days after the fact. And I said, that's reason to, to get rid of it. Um, it, it was just sneaky. And uh, I didn't like the comment. I didn't fully comprehend what she was trying to say, number one. I think it's a good thing to be able to comprehend some of, you know, at least some of it. Uh, and uh, I just didn't like the the slant of the comment. So, um, because I, I didn't have the, I didn't, I had never been given the right to remove her. 
she never even come up in my line of sight in any way, um, I decided to just da disable the comments under that video. I had I had read all the comments, so all of them had made. I, I felt that um, everybody that had wanted to make a comment had, and um, er all the rest were able to read those comments as well, who, who was interested in who was making who was maybe coming to the channel and and um I thought we all enjoyed that and so anyway that's why I did that um so I appreciate all my my commenters I uh, I appreciate um you know the information that so many of them provide and and um cuz it does it's helpful um I appreciate it I thank you so much um, so I hope the Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth. I hope you find, um, the video enlightening in some way. Uh, like I said, I apologize. I'm kind of tired. I'm a little tired. I think I'll go to bed early tonight. I'm quite exhausted this evening. Um, but, um, I felt I had said that I would do it and, um, I felt that I needed to do it. And, uh, now that it's done, I'm quite glad that I did. So again, thanks for watching my videos. Um, I pray the Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth, and I hope you all have a lovely evening, and thanks again.